So this is Bopisodes, which is which means Born on Purpose episodes. A great friend of mine, um, great guy, and he's um, he's an entertainment character. He has been the entertainment director for one of the big cruise ship lines. So in charge of creating and uh, producing all the, the entertainment? I don't know. He, he'll tell us. So how are you, Alan? Good to see you. Same. So yeah, we're, we're uh, going through what you all went through last month and months before that. So yeah, it's getting get bad the market is just taking a tumble and everything's closing Disneyland is going to close so that's like pretty crazy tell us a little bit about you and how you kind of got started in in what you're doing yeah. and at what point in your life did you kind of go oh man this is the life for me this is what I want to do from a very early age, uh, and I would say that would be nine or ten, took me that long, I knew for sure that I had a gift of music. And <clears throat> the reason I knew that is that my uh, parents bought me a piano and I just started to sit down and play it. And I had really no training and I could figure it, I could figure it out. I really, really, really thought that this was going to be my career. So I uh, head to college and I played trombone in high school because it was the only instrument that uh, no one else wanted to play. <laughs> so my band director said, okay, you're playing trombone. All right, so I, I, I went and played, I played trombone in the band and the orchestra and I was in a high school, a high school of 7,000 students. So for me, it was like a college experience. And the band, there were three orchestras, there were three jazz bands, there were th four concert bands, and I was in them. I just loved it. I knew this was my life. And um, one of the things about high school, in the high school I went, is that there is a senior production every year written completely by the senior class and produced and put on stage and from my freshman year, my dream was always to write the music and become the conductor of that group. And that was called Lanya. The name of the show is called Lanya. It's still Lanya to this day. I got that gig and I wrote all the music for this musical. And I wrote all the orchestration and conducted the orchestra. We had a hydraulic pit with a, with a you know, 30 piece orchestrated. Wow. And it was the great, it was amazing experience. I should say that my parents were really into Broadway musicals and my dad would always bring home the latest musical. I remember to this day him bringing home The Sound of Music with wow. Mary Martin and all that. So I, I grew up in that style. I wrote this essentially a Broadway musical for high school and decided, no, I didn't decide. My dad decided I was gonna to go to the University of Illinois. It was an in-state school and it was cheap. And so I did, and I went to the University of Illinois. I auditioned as a trombone player and did not get into the school of music. Oh. So it was like, oh my gosh, what, what turn is my life going to take? So the turn it took was instead of Getting a Bachelor of Music degree, I got a Bachelor of Arts degree with a major in music. I was not instrumentally good enough to get into the music school, but I majored in theory and competition, music theory and composition. And so for those four years, I actually got to take more music classes than music majors. It was crazy. And I had a great support team in the School of Music and they liked my writing and so I got my Bachelor of Arts degree and then immediately went and got a Master of Music degree and a Doctor of Musical Arts in composition. Here I am, a doctor in music, going, what is my next move? Well, the next move for anyone that has that sort of degree, you go teach music at a college. And that's what I did. I went and taught music 
Theory and Composition at the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia, which was the first of my four careers. Wow. So, okay, so yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you for a second. When you did the high school production, was it like yeah. junior, senior? Uh, you know, senior. Senior, okay. Senior. So when it's, you're a senior, you wrote The whole that. production is, yeah, the whole production is produced, written by seniors. Okay, okay, and, okay. Um, so when you get to the senior class, uh, you know, again, I mean, there's 2,000 people in my graduating class, 2,000 seniors in high school. Wow. And these productions were Broadway quality productions. I mean, it was the best of everything. So that was my dream, and my dream came true, and it was great. Okay. I get to the University of Illinois, and hard awakening. I couldn't play trumpet well enough to get into the music school, but I spent the next seven years getting a doctorate in composition. And after that, I got my very first job, well, first real job, which was teaching theory and composition at the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia. As part of the faculty, I felt that I had arrived. I thought this was great. The University of Richmond was an incredible experience, a great school, still is today. I helped it get accredited in uh, music so we could offer graduate degrees and, and, and all that stuff. So I taught theory and composition and was rolling along great and uh, had was also a member of the theater department where I produced a lot of the music uh, for the theater group. And comes time for tenure, eight years later, and I'm up for tenure against, against, with the chairman of the music department. Oh my, okay. So I was chosen to give the sesquicentennial lecture for the entire university. And I gave this lecture. It was a huge, huge success. I mean, standing ovation, everybody. And the next day, uh, oh, and the, the, the dean, uh, comes up to me and says, That's, that was an amazing lecture. Unbelievable. And the next day he calls me in his office and tells me I did not get tenure despite a unanimous recommendation from the faculty. I did not get it because there was only one slot and guess who that slot went to? Oh my. The chairman of the party. So it was... Another slot. Another, <laughs> another moment of, wow, what do I do now? Well, what I didn't say was that in the summers while I was teaching, I joined a big band, 17-piece big band. I played trombone in the band for three years, in, uh, piano for three years. And it was called the Kings of Swing. And that band, started by Bruce Schwartz, is still going to this day. Wow. But the, the point of the story is that that band went down to a theme park about uh, 45 minutes south of the University of Richmond called Bush Gardens in Williamsburg. And we went down there, we auditioned for the house band for a musical they were doing, we got the job. And the next summer I uh, was supervisor of music at, for just for the summer, because it was a seasonal theme park. When it comes time, Gresham Riley says to me, uh, sorry, Alan, but you are not granted tenure. I go, oh man, what is, what's the next turn my life is gonna take? And honest to goodness, Bob, two days later, the phone rings. It's Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. Their manager was promoted to corporate. Their assistant manager was promoted to manager and they wanted to know if I want to be assistant manager uh, at Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. Wow. I said, yeah, that phone call started a 30 year career wow. with theme parks. Wow. And with one theme park, and that theme park was Bush Williamsburg for 10 years, and then 20 years I did, uh, I got promoted to corporate, and that was with Bush Entertainment. Bush Entertainment, at that time, they don't exist any longer under that name. But they owned the three SeaWorld, the four SeaWorld parks at that time, and the two Bush Gardens Park, Williamsburg and Tampa. And eventually, by the time I left, 30 years later, they had 10 theme parks. I was director of uh, entertainment for Bush uh, Entertainment Corporation and oversaw uh, 10 theme parks. So that was a great career, right? 
Yeah. I was, <laughs> yeah. So until, and who would have, who would have ever thought this? And you may remember this day. Um, Anheuser Busch, the largest brewer, brewer in North America, and certainly a major brewer in the world, was bought out, unbelievably so, by a company called InBev. What was the name and of the company? InBev bought uh, InBev. I N B E V. When InBev bought Bush Entertainment Corporation, no, bought Anheuser Busch, the brewery. Their first announcement was we were going to divest ourselves of all the theme parks. Handwriting on the wall, baby. Wow. So um, I was 58 years old. I had 30 years with the company. <clears throat> and I was eligible for early retirement. So I took it. Got my pension. But was all of a sudden out of a job. Right? I sent out... 785, honest to God, 785 resumes. This was 2009, which you will remember was the worst time in the world to get a job anywhere. Yeah. As it was, is kind of like what's going on right now. Yeah, I was unemployed so, at the same time. So, <laughs> so seven, 785 resumes. And from that, I got one job. I waited nine months to get that job. And that job was in the Netherlands. And that job was producing a dolphin show for the Dolphin area in Hardewijk, which is outside of Amsterdam. And I took that job. It was a fabulous job. And that is where I met Julian and Ave. They were the, the head dolphin trainers at the Dolphin area. I forgot to mention that I started my own entertainment company, mm. a consulting company. That, uh, that's the resumes I sent out. And so I got this job, and that led to other jobs, obviously, and eventually led, after some time, to a position with Chimba. Mm -hmm. So I had been in theme parks for 30 years. I went wow. out on my, own, my third career being an entertainment consultant, and um, eventually got a lot of, you know, Sea Worldy or theme park jobs. And because of my good association with a company called PGAV in the United States, who built many of the theme parks for Bush Entertainment, including Sea World, they asked me to come work on a project. We were both in St. Louis. They came to work on this project that they're working on for uh, Chimbong. And they had built these stadiums, but they had no shows to put in the stadium, so they didn't know how to equip the stadium. Mm. So they, they asked me to come in and write some shows for them, for these stadiums, which I did over a period of uh, three weeks. I wrote 13 shows. And the coolest thing, you would appreciate this, as I'm writing the show, as I'm writing it out and thinking about it, I have an artist sitting right next to me who's drawing the show. And then they bring me to Guangzhou to present these ideas to Mr. Sue. Long story short, after three trips, Mr. Sue comes up to me and says, how would you like to work for me? And that started a uh, two and a half year. 2014, I was offered my fourth career opportunity, which was with a company called Princess Cruises and uh, they needed a manager of Asia Entertainment as they were entering the Asia market in, uh, in cruising. And they said, we need someone that speaks Mandarin and someone that knows the Asia market. I said, I don't speak Mandarin and I don't really know the Asian market, but boy, do I want this guy. Yeah. <laughs> so after, after an interview, I, I got the job and then uh, nine months later was promoted to director and I retained that position for five years and retired last February. You ask about a turning point. My turning points came as a result of a roadblock in my way and reinventing what I wanted to do. But throughout it all was this idea of music, was this idea, this passion for entertainment, this passion for bringing happiness to people, this uh, 
passion for being part of the creative process. And I have to say, that's what's driven me my entire career, is this passion for being part of the creative process, something that I knew at five years old. When I first got that piano and started plunking away and teaching myself, I knew that creatively I was a left brain person. I knew that was part of my makeup. And I kept following paths that just fed that passion and fed that sense of who I was and being able to contribute in a creative way and being able to, on a large scale, hopefully make a difference in people's lives by entertaining them, making them happy. So four careers. College wow. professor, uh, being part for 30 years on my own as president of my own entertainment company, and finally with a cruise line. Oh, man, who would have thought that would happen? But so much, so many similarities. I went from being a director of 10 theme parks to be of entertainment for 10 theme parks to being a director of entertainment for 18 cruise ships, 17 cruise ships. So not much difference. It's just that the, the theme parks from the Bush entertainment days were now floating <laughs> floating entertainment venues, floating hotel in the princess days. And I have to say, I had an incredible staff to work with that had known the cruise industry for, for a very long time. So they helped me find my way. And then the similarities in terms of management style, similarities in terms of the way you contribute to an overall product and uh, ideation and the processes that go through all that, as you know, as you well know, when you're uh, ideating, coming up with ideas for a show, or for uh, it's the same process. So it stood me well for many, many years. Now I am old, 21, retired, and loving life. So I guess this is my fifth career. Thank you for that. That that, that pretty amazing career, yeah. Alan. The, yeah. the one of the questions that kind of comes up in my head is. Did it feel like you got a skill set, a, as you just kind of stated there, th that process of producing a show right from high school, did you pretty much kind of take that similar skill set and just plug it into each situation as, Absolutely. you know, almost like a tool set? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it has, as I said, it stuck with me through all these years, is this, this skill set of well when you're a conductor you you manage people i've conducted a lot so you're you're kind of a manager i conducted the the college orchestra and that kind of skill set that management skill set not say nothing to me too. the management of a group like that has stood me well as i moved into management for uh bush entertainment as i moved in my own management and as i'm uh worked with princess so that skill set for sure. And then this idea of, of being part of the creative process, obviously, has been there the entire time so, from the very beginning. But that, that management skill set wasn't, that was that something that you formally got trained in or is that something that you just developed on your own? <laughs> no, that was throw them into the swimming pool, see if you can swim. Okay. Try kind of training, trial by fire. <laughs> you become the head of an orchestra or it's just, just like, a family, here, <laughs> and you have to you have to manage all the quirky personalities, and you know the fact that the oboe player doesn't want to sit next to the second oboe player, or that, and you have to handle auditions, and you have there's so much there is so much in in doing that, I, and that all went back to uh, I conducted my very first piece, which was a piece I wrote in uh, my eighth grade band. I wrote a piece for a girl that I was in love with. Her name was Sarah. I called the piece, I called the piece, Hurrah, which was Sarah spelled backwards with an accent. And, but, but I wrote a piece for a full band and the band director was kind enough to let me conduct it. And once I got a taste of that, man, there was no stopping me. I, I think conducting is my favorite thing ever. But what that does is it teaches you by force to manage people. Mm -hmm. And as you get, as I got into the college orchestras and then many other uh, situations where I have conducted, 
you ha- I conducted a lot of recording sessions for Bush Entertainment through the years up in Seattle. All of that is about organization, about managing people, about get, making efficient use of your time, about getting your ducks in a row before you step on that podium for rehearsal. All that, which translated obviously then to management style for Bush Entertainment and for Princess and, and other things. So yeah. Do you, do you find the musicians, because of their their discipline, because any good musician has to spend hours and hours at their craft, and uh, you know, so they so they develop a sense of of you know personal discipline. Um, does that spill over into their sort of professional behavior w- within a group? Or? Absolutely. The musicians I work with, and musicians around the world. They're in it because their their hearts in it because this is a gift that was given to them, and they want to share with the world. And so these musicians bear a personal responsibility. I've seen this universally: a personal responsibility to be true to their craft and to want to share that gift with other people and give them a sense of happiness or inform them about music or, or write lyrics that inform uh, their listeners about uh, the world situation. It's it's a unique set of individuals that are universally passionate and universally want to uh, reach out and touch other people. No, well, they're forced to do it as a group. They're forced to do it. Yeah. I mean, sure, there's solo things, and I'm sure there's a, there's ego that what makes each one of them want to do a solo and have their own little you know limelight. But in general, they know that they need you know the the the, comp- the compliments of the rest of the crew. Certainly, in a symphony situation, that's that's the case, yeah. where you have all these musicians working together for a single outcome. In in like jazz, it's completely different, where you have individuals that are are expressing themselves through improvisation and and it's it's a different kind of mindset but still the outcome is one that through discipline training these people have uh created a craft that is uh, very deeply personal and one that touches a great many people it's a different dynamic in a orchestra a large group than it would be in a in a rock band or in a jazz band or something like that, but still the same discipline. My world, the art world, was a little bit different because I had a lot of individuals. <laughs> Period. You know, <laughs> like, you know. I mean, including myself, where where you, you know we we had our vision and our way to do it, and, and in the West it was more a little bit more difficult de- dealing with lots of artists. You know, on a particular project yeah. or something. Yeah, and that's uh, you know the a, a sobering responsibility. That but lots of fun, lots of challenges. You know, a little stressful Indeed. at times though. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And Absolutely. It, and it is showbiz. Yeah. So that, so yeah. you know, at some point the curtain opens. You know, and and you got to be ready, and it's got to yeah. be there. Have you seen some sort of a change that happened over the, the 40 years that you were doing that? Well, it's certainly an evolutionary process, right? And that evolution was driven by technology. Just as George Lucas redid his first Star Wars movie, many years later when the technology matched his vision, right? So the same thing happens when you are in the throes of creating projects for theme parks. And many people have a lot of great ideas and incredible ideas, but sometimes those ideas are handcuffed by technology. The greatest evolution I saw was the move from analog to digital, Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in music and in many other things. And you you would attest to this as as well. I don't know what tools you use now artistically, but the tools I use now to write music are all digital. They're all on my computer. I write on my computer. I don't sit at a piano. And uh, that music is instantly realized and instantly I can hear it. Mm -hmm. As I write it, I can hear it. Yeah, I hear it here first. But then I I orchestrate or something, I hear it. Same is true with movies, same as, I mean, media, everything. 
So, and technology, stage lighting, uh, stage uh, craft, all of this, all of this technology was driving the industry and driving the industry to realize visions that were perhaps not possible two years ago or three years ago or 10 years ago. So the biggest change I saw with hands down is the digital revolution and the reliance and the help that technology aided in in achieving those those visions for shows or parks or whatever. All of this, all of this technology, I think is the driving force in the creative process. The ideas have always been there. The ideas have always been great. And the way in which you are able to achieve those ideas and put and make those happen, that's that's what technology adds now. I think so, you're right. And, and uh, the the one of the things that that did or does for me is the testing part, the the evaluation yeah. of what's happening. You get to as you say, you get to hear it now. Instead of just in your head yeah. imagining the orchestra, you can create the orchestra right. on your computer and see, oh, you know what? I could tweak that. That would be better. So uh, instant. It's, it's just gotten more instant. I, I just did it the other day. I just finished a gigantic band piece and ran it through the Sibelius software and, and heard the whole thing. It's, it's, it's incredible. Wow. And you know, you now, um, even in the time I was at Chimlong, advancement in 3D modeling, you know, I mean, which wasn't there maybe 10 years ago. Now you can see if there's uh, going to be a, a pipe in the way of your HVAC. Or it's unbelievable. So that has really pushed the industry and all industries along. I agree. I agree. And, that, and, that, and it's so hopefully we're using it to, to go a little bit faster. You know, I mean, that, that's a little yeah. bit happening. The other thing that I see with in, in the music world is I see a lot of artists that are able to stand more as individuals. You know, I mean, I see a lot of videos and stuff where y y they'll lay down a track and then they'll pick up a different instrument and lay down a different track and, and you know, and, and it's... Oh, sure. And it's happening. It's streaming as they're doing it, you know. So they're they're sort of yeah. composing yeah. as they go. And uh, as an individual, I, I'm sure that's something that you enjoy. Like you just mentioned, you get to not actually deal with all the personalities and the and the problems <laughs> that you you created such skill at, at, at managing people. You get to not worry about that so much, you know. But but would you agree when when it's played? live by real people there's still a there's nothing like it. there's nothing like it i mean i did my doctoral thesis on a composer named charles hives who really was uh an innovator of his time um, mid uh early uh 20th century and you know his his sense was that the live aspect of any music had such an excitement to it because there are mistakes, because not everything goes well, because there's this anticipation, because every time you play it, it's different. Every time you play it, that's the beauty of music. You know, every every time anything is played live, it's different than the last time it was played live. And even even Beethoven's Fifth, you you know, you go to a, a concert of Beethoven's Fifth, and you know it note for note, but well, you know it not for I don't know. This is certain tempi, <laughs> certain, well, well, yeah, but certain, you know, certain tempi. The sure. Rolling Stones, when they play uh, any of their hits, they uh, can't get no satisfaction, maybe. It's, wow. it's different every single time, right? That's the beauty of live music, and that's where the excitement is. Now, you know, I, I when you listen to this piece, it, it sounds like a band. I mean, it sounds amazing, but... There's nothing like a live performance to, to to really bring it to life, and also every subsequent live performance will be different, and that's the beauty of it all. Very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. I think you're a good point. So that seems to be uh, maybe one of the challenges here is uh, 
keeping from slipping too much into the digital um, uh, and still re kind of respecting because well, I, I, digital is a means to an end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, digital is a way to get things more efficiently on paper and more accurately realized. But the goal of all of this is a live performance as, as it should be. In the old days, I would write by hand. I would write notes on paper, just as you would take a paintbrush mm -hmm. and paint on a canvas, right? Or paint on a wall. All right, so I'm gonna turn the phone around for one second. So, let's see, you can see that, right? Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, oh good, yeah, I can see it. Wow, okay, All so. Right, good. All right, so can you imagine writing all this by hand <laughs> would take forever. Yeah. The beauty of it now is I can hear it. I'll just, I'll click a button and. Okay. You would, in, in college as a composer, I would sit in my dorm room and painstakingly write out every note and hopefully someday I would hear it. Now, you write this piece of music, you you see it as you write it, you write it digitally, right? It comes out as notes, you hear it instantaneously, and then you print out the parts. Wow. I mean, it's, you take, you take the entire score and the score prints out the parts, and then people play those parts. And I had a great experience in um, up in Breckenridge this summer where I got to conduct a world premiere of one of my band pieces. And it was from score to parts, to performance. And the other thing is, you know the parts are right because you've heard the score, you know the notes are right. So when you print the parts, everybody plays them and it comes out the way you should. Wow. The difference being, it's a live performance, right. which breathes life into that. That piece will always, always, always be and sound the same because it's being played by a computer. I can't wait for the day when it's played by live musicians, hopefully, and it will be an entirely different experience. Sure. And then every time it's played, it'll be a completely different experience. So that's a long discussion about digital efficiency, but that has made our lives easier and quicker than I love it. So that's great. Do you have do you have equivalents in the art world? Well, sure. I mean, you, you, I mean, for me, it's that it is that digital modeling stuff. It's the three D modeling. It's it's where right. AutoCAD. Uh, yeah, AutoCAD, AutoCAD and yeah. stuff. Because I mean, years and years ago, uh, I'm thinking fifteen, almost twenty years ago, I was learning AutoCAD stuff, and I learned Autodesk three D. It was right after nine eleven, and I was unemployed, and and I, I I went down to the store and I bought. There used to be these huge books that you could go to the, the bookstores that are closed now. But <laughs> yeah, a huge thick book on a software, on Autodesk, right? And I brought it home. Yes. Yeah, and I, I sat that. at my desk and I went page by page through the instruction of how to do this 3D uh, drawing, right? And by the that end of the, like you. Yes, well, well, by the end of the book, I, I was pretty efficient at, not great, but good that I could do anything I wanted to. I knew a way to do yeah. it. There's there's always several ways to go about doing it with these softwares, but I had at least one way to do anything I needed to do. And right. I, you would virtually build the building or build the uh, the store or the, the interior or whatever you're doing. You, you literally, and I thought, oh my God, well, this is the way we should do this, you know, because because it, 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 it solved and I remember I was doing the interior of some retail store and I and I did all the parts and pieces and the shelving and the and the the, yeah. the bookshelf and all that stuff and I could see where things clashed and I could see where it ran into the wall and where the electrical lines had to go and had, so it was magical to me and w what confounded me is that this was 20 years ago how come everyone isn't just doing this 
it, you know, they're still they're still doing blueprint type drawings and and yeah. you know things that, that blueprints. Yeah, that don't. That, you know, they're still there with the with the music pages doing the score by hand, and then expecting it all to come together when they could build the whole thing. So, so, and they're still kind of doing that. There's, st- I mean, unfortunately, I don't really you, well, know. You remember, you remember the blueprints. Piles of oh. blueprints at Chipmunk. Do you remember? They're still there. <laughs> Just <Yeah>. like <laughs> it, it, it's it's crazy. There's sure they bring in garbage bags full of drawings you know and then yes <laughs> and there's just yes. there's rooms yes. full of this paper and you know <laughs> there's no better use for a tree than to you know knock it down and <laughs> cut it up for for this kind of stuff but <laughs> i digress a little bit because the, the 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 way that i get to use that uh, in in my world is i do a lot with color things so i can see sure. You know, as opposed to painting the wall and going in and doing this and this and that, you can see what the color scheme looks like. And on a computer, it's click, 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 eh, you know, me to it, uh, you know what, I'm going to put a little blue here, eh, uh, yeah, oh, oh, that looks better, you know, or, or oh, this will yeah. look good. Yeah. yeah. And then you put it on the image and go, oh, that looks like shit, you know, so, <laughs> so. I remember you doing that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but again, this is how technology has helped the artistic world move forward, both in your realm and environment right and in the creative process in general Mm -hmm. you know we now have these tools at our fingertips that are remarkable i just saw last night an interview with the sound designer for hamilton and the board they're using which is astounding a fully digital soundboard to mix the 27 mics that he's that he's working with constantly it is just a revolution so wow uh, phenomenal the cool, the cool thing is, what's next? That's two more things I want to talk about, and we're kind of running along here because it's, I'm really having fun and really entertaining. But the, the always a big question I like to ask people are, what are the mistakes that are being made <laughs> in the in your industry? What what's uh, you know that, and then the next thing is what what do you think is going to happen in the future? But let's let's talk mistakes. Right. I think one of the biggest mistakes is Me Tooism, which is different from the Me Too movement. So Me Tooism is that there is, and you see this everywhere, there's a hit show like Friends, and then all of a sudden there's all these other shows that come up that are like that, that are never quite as successful. Or there is a uh, movie genre that that just changes the, the game, but then all of a sudden every else everybody else is on board. So I think the biggest, uh, and this this is true in theme park rides, in development of theme park attractions, in development of attractions for cruise ships. Something gets a lot of notoriety, something gets a lot of attention, then all of a sudden, for some reason, the creativity shuts down in all the other competitors, and they, they hop on board that with a slight difference here or there. But it almost stifles creativity when you get such a huge impact of a single thing. So I think part of the mistake, one of the biggest mistakes is, one of the biggest challenges is trying to remain independent and innovative without that influence. It's it's really hard because you see how incredibly pervasive a certain attraction can be. And then copycats all over the world. And that to me is almost stifling to the creative process. So mistakes are trying to copy somebody else without thinking originally. In terms of where we're going, I think that uh, the name of my company, when I started my own company, was Sky's the Limit. And I think the greatest thing about this business, your business, my business, you're only handcuffed by your own imagination, but your own imagination can also make you soar. I don't know if you've seen it yet. There is a an incredible interview with Elon Musk. I don't know what you think of him as a person, but as a thinker, as an original thinker, this guy is standing. This guy just knows his stuff. And he is thinking out of the box like nobody else. And we need more of that. And I think as technology allows us to move in directions that we weren't allowed to move for it before. A good caution here. A good cautionary note about the Me Too stuff. The, the, 
yeah. trying to ride the back of some other success, you know. Uh, right. And, and maybe that's driven a little bit. I know in, in our industry, the theme park stuff, it's driven a little bit by financial stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's hey, right. that worked. Uh, that worked for them. They made a lot of money with it. Let's try to do the same thing. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and it's less of a gamble, you know. I mean, there is something uh, yeah. even even in this internet stuff that I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of internet stuff now. There, there's there's the term hacking, you know, um, uh, oh, yeah. which has come to mean uh, go find what's being successful and you know redo that, re re you know take it take it a yeah. little bit yourself, but it's that yeah. same same concept of well that works. Or like product-wise, oh, everybody's right. selling those. I'm going to jump on board and sell sell those too, you know, um, because it's a wave right. that, that that rides through. So people are they're using that to make money, and I think, you know, there's a degree of that in any kind of industry, I suppose. But but it, yeah, uh, it, yeah, uh, you and 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 people like yourself are, are on the creative end of it and trying to push the envelope. Cool. Okay. Well, let's kind of let's kind of wrap this up a little bit. How about advice to somebody that wants to, to bust into the industry that you do? What? How? How would you go about it these days? You know, I fell into it. I literally fell into it through a lot of roadblocks. <clears throat> these days, <clears throat> the key is everybody has a resume. Everybody has a portfolio. The key is absolutely making yourself heard above the din of everybody else. And how do you do that? You make personal contact with those people with whom you want to be associated. It's the only way to do it. And when you do that, mm. don't give up. I think that's the only way to do it nowadays. There are so many people that are equally proficient in so many professions. How do you get yourself heard? You get yourself heard by persistence, by showing your wares, by absolutely being confident. Now, the best, the most amazing thing that happened to me, which was a kid who was in eighth grade, who was scared to answer a question that the teacher would pose, would never raise his hand, is accessing confidence. And how do you do that? By building one little brick at a time, small successes that eventually turn into bigger successes, that eventually turn into a legacy that you can be proud of. And confidence is the driver in getting yourself heard and getting yourself seen. And the more confident we are, you are, the more you will succeed. Great advice, great advice. I mean, it's a, I heard a, a joke that I, I, I always tell all the time that the elevator to success is broken, it's out of order. Um, you got to use the stairs. Yeah, that's right. You got to go step by step. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. That's so, good. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> and and this is this has been great, Bob. This oh, been wonderful. Really Thanks so much, Alan, for, for for taking the time with us, and and um, I'll, oh, always, I'll always send you the trailer. Healthy. Yeah, uh, you, you too. Yeah, take take good care of yourself now that that stuff is waving through. Yeah. But but just. You know, well, everybody wash your hands, <laughs> you know, and uh, and Indeed. don't yeah, Indeed. and don't worry about. We'll get through this. Yeah, get through it. And the the whole mask thing in in Asia, that was something I'm sure that you found when you came to Asia. When people got sick, they used to wear masks. You know, which always. I always thought always, was weird. Yeah. yeah, when whenever somebody had a cold or something, they would wear a mask. Yeah, and it would kept it from spreading. Yeah. Um, we never did that in America for whatever reason. I guess it wasn't cool or whatever. Right. Don't worry about being cool. Wear the damn mask, you know. <laughs> so, okay. So, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, Alan. Hey, thanks uh, so much. Advice. All right. Talk to you Great soon. To also, I'll send you more information about this stuff as it as it gets right. developed. Okay. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.